I've kind of been on the fence for a while about whether to share something and why not. Um, I don't know if you remember, but it was way back in the year 2020, the month of January, that our country experienced an impeachment. I don't know if you can think way back to early May of 2020, but we'd already been dealing with like a month and a half of pandemic. That seems like forever ago. Uh, And right now, that really is not on the forefront of our minds. We're living in a time where everything is political, and I'm not going to get political, okay? Don't worry, settle down. But our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against a spiritual enemy that is seeking to steal and kill and destroy. And so there are two impacts that I can see from that reality. Number one is that there is no human being on the face of this planet that is your enemy. Right? Our battle is not against flesh and blood. So if you see human beings as your enemy, we need an adjustment there. The second reality is that we are not going to win this battle in human ability. This is a spiritual battle that we are fighting. So I would suggest to you that this may not be the last time that some big event happens in our society. 2020 has been a crazy year, and maybe there's more in store. The next issue that pops up, whatever it might be, there's going to be a huge move to make it political, because that's the world that we live in. All of us believe what we believe, because we're sure it's true. G.K. Chesterton says that the reasonable person understands that something in their belief system is wrong. We don't know what it is, or it wouldn't be part of our belief system, right? But we're all wrong about something. We just don't know what it is. Which means that our side in any of these issues is sometimes wrong. We don't know what it is, or it wouldn't be our side. But there are people in this congregation that are all over the political spectrum, even all over the theological spectrum. That's okay. This right here is our source of truth. This is where we find out where we're supposed to stand on these issues. And we still might disagree when we look here. But when the next issue comes up, if our first response is to look up what our side is saying, what our favorite politician is saying, or what our favorite media personality is saying, or our favorite celebrity is saying. If that's our first response, it seems to me that at best we're unwise, and at worst we're idolaters. Because God's opinion is the first place that we should be seeking. The next issue that comes up, my prayer is that we would start with God's word. We would start with God's heart, and then we can go back and see if our side agrees with that. Rather than starting with what our side says and then trying to justify it in the scriptures. That's backwards. Let's not be idolaters. Let's not be unwise. All right, you're going to need your Bibles. I do not have a whole bunch of slides with the scriptures on there because I didn't feel like spending a lot, time, a lot of time putting three chapters onto slides. We are going to get through three chapters. It's, it's okay. Um, but I would encourage you to pull out your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 7. And if your Bible, if you're at home and your Bible is clear on the other side of the house, there is a pause button. You're not going to miss anything. If you hit that pause button, you can go get your Bible and then unpause it, all right? So we're going to read uh, Matthew chapter 7. And it's uh, starting in verse 24 is where we're going to start. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. You've probably heard that a time or two before. Did you know there are two interpretations of this text? One interpretation of the wise and foolish builders is that if we will devote ourselves to studying Jesus' words, and then we will consciously and actively put them into practice, then by doing so, we will build our houses upon the rock. And so this interpretation puts the ball in our hands. Memorize Jesus' words and then do your best to put them into practice and you will build your house on the foundation. But there's another interpretation here. It's kind of the reverse of that. That would say, if my house is built on the foundation of rock, then I will live out Jesus' commands. I won't just hear what Jesus has to say, but I'll actually do it. And so it's kind of backwards. The foundation comes first, and my actions come second. But which one is right? Well, let's read it one more time and see if we can find anything there. Therefore, let's stop there. I don't know if you've ever taken a Bible class, but one of the, one of the rules you might learn in Bible class is anytime you see a therefore, you need to look to see what it's there for. All right? This is at the end of something called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus preaches a sermon, which kind of makes my job easier. He gets to do much, most of the preaching today. He preaches what's called the Sermon on the Mount, and this is the very last parable in that. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to go through his sermon and see if that informs what he says in the wise and the foolish builders. Chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 1. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is another word for happy. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt, is lost, if the salt loses his, its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. All right, this next sentence is the thesis statement of the entire Sermon on the Mount, so pay attention. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, we're going to go through some teachings that Jesus gives on very specific issues. And there is nuance to these things. The Bible was not written in English. English does not exist as a language when the Bible was written. So churches and Bible studies can spend months going through the Sermon on the Mount, 
teaching by teaching. And it's a good thing to do to appreciate exactly what Jesus is saying each time. Today, we're going to take it all in at once because Jesus preached this all at once. And we just want to get the big picture of what Jesus is saying by the time we get back to the, the parable of the wise and foolish men. Okay? So verse 21. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. Now, where did it say that? It said that in the law. The law said, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. This is the pattern that we're going to see set up. Jesus says, you have heard it said in the law, do not do this or do this. And then sometimes actually what Jesus quotes will not actually be from the law. It will be from teachings that were added onto the law by the Pharisees and by the teachers of the law. So they had their tradition that was added on top of the law. The whole idea, though, of the law from the beginning, and, and God told us this through the prophets, the whole idea of the law was it was supposed to show us that we were not good enough to earn right relationship with God. People thought, maybe I can be right with God in and of myself. God gave us the law so that we would break the law and we'd say, "Uh uh-oh, I need a savior. But there was this group of people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law, that actually thought that they were fulfilling the law. And so Jesus' teachings here, remember, he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you will have no part in the kingdom of heaven. So there's the pattern. You have heard it said, you're not murder, but anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep your oaths that you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right te- cheek, turn to him the other also. And if somebody wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one that asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to, uh, sorry, borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Let's stop at that one for just a second. Because we read that, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And we might say, you know what? 
If I had been around and really aware of what was going on back, back in the 1940s, I would have loved Hitler. I would have prayed for Hitler. Sure. Sure you would. Or uh, how about today? You know what? I love the people of ISIS or Boko Haram. I pray for the members of ISIS and Boko Haram. Maybe. I mean, we're not face-to-face with those people. How about, I don't know, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? Do you love Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? How about Rush Limbaugh or Ilhan Omar? Do you pray for Rush Limbaugh and Ilhan Omar? Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Do you feel perfect right now? Do you feel like so far, everything that we've read, you're like, yep, check it off. I'm doing great. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. Wait, what? Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. But didn't Jesus just say, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and praise your Father who is in heaven? We'll have to come back to that one. If you do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Verse 2, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom Come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received the reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who sees or who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The light, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either, either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or, what you will, or, or your, about your body, what you will wear. Is life not important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or soar away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here to get today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, 
So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Do not worry. Super easy, right? Super easy to just be like, yeah, I'm not going to worry. Chapter 7, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there was a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred do not throw your pearls to pigs if you do they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives he who seeks finds and to him who knocks the door will be opened which of you if he asks for uh, if his son asks for bread will give him a stone or if he asks for a fish will give him a snake If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. I want you to remember that word many. It's the Greek word polis, polis. It's where we get the prefix poly, meaning many. All right? Many enter through this wide gate and this broad road. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. They look like Christians, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. We see this imagery of fruit a lot. Not just in the New Testament, where it's all over the place. It's like the dominant picture of following God and what it looks like when the Holy Spirit is inside of us making a difference. It even happens in the Old Testament. The idea is that what we do comes from who we are. Doing comes from being. So if we are a good tree, we produce good fruit. But if we are a bad tree, we produce bad fruit. The bad news is that every single person who has ever been been born, save one, was born a bad tree. And so when we see this world around us and we see bad fruit all over the place, it is not a surprise. Bad trees produce bad fruit. The last two weeks, John has pointed back to Ezekiel chapter 36. And in Ezekiel 36, we have the promise of the new covenant, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we spent a lot of time looking at the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel chapter 36 we get the picture of God taking our hearts, our old hearts. He calls them the heart of stone and removing it and putting a new heart inside of us. The heart is what we would call the soul. It's the engine of who we are. It's our decider. It's our core. And so when we are born... We have hard hearts, and we are bad trees, and it causes us to do bad things. We bear bad fruit. 
But the promise of the new covenant was that God was going to remove that old heart and put a brand new one in there. A good heart that would produce good fruit. But not only would he change our core, who we are, he would also give us his Holy Spirit. The creator of the universe would move inside. And so what happens if God is living inside of us? What does our fruit look like? It looks like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. It's supernatural love and supernatural joy and supernatural peace and patience and kindness. Good trees produce good fruit supernaturally so. So you'll notice... In verse 19, it says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That is a very clear message there. Notice Jesus doesn't say every tree that produces bad fruit will be thrown into the fire. Because for those of us in whom God has moved in, we still have this battle between the spirit and the flesh. We have neural pathways in our brains even that have been taught for years and years how to sin. So even after God moves inside, we're still going to sin. We're still going to mess up. We're still going to see some of that bad fruit coming out. However, if the Holy Spirit is inside of us, he will produce good fruit. He will produce good fruit. So any tree that does not produce good fruit is not inhabited by the Holy Spirit. And thus, will find itself in the fire someday. It's a very clear warning, isn't it? Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Here is the scariest teaching in the Bible, in my opinion. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Let's go back to uh, a previous teaching back in uh, chapter 5, verse 13. I think we've got a slide so that we don't have to flip back. You are the salt of the earth. Was Jesus saying that you're flavoring? Was he saying to the the people in their society, hey, you're going to make everything a party? Salt was not just for flavoring back in the day. Before there was refrigeration, salt was a preservative. Salt was what kept food from spoiling. So when Jesus says to these people that are called to be his disciples, when he says, you are the salt of the earth, he's saying, your job is to preserve society. Question for you. Looking at our society, do you feel like it's being preserved? Or do you feel like it's being the opposite of preserved? I know what I think. And you might disagree with me, and that's okay. But I feel like in our society today, the salt has lost its saltiness. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, on a macro scale, on a big picture scale, if it's true that the salt has lost its saltiness, if the people that are calling themselves the church are not preserving our society, then it's very possible that some of the people in the church are the people that someday are going to say to Jesus, Lord, Lord, didn't we minister powerfully in your name? If Jesus were to say to you at the end of time, if he were to put you in this group and he's about to send you away, what would your objection be? It would be terrifying. What would you say? But Jesus, I made a decision to follow you. But Jesus, 
I asked you into my heart, but Jesus, I ministered powerfully in your name. That's what these people say here. We, we cast out demons. We prophesied. We performed miracles in your name. But notice their objection is rooted in what they did. Our understanding of salvation is that we don't save ourselves. Our salvation is what he does. So it's a dead giveaway if someday it looks like Jesus is about to send us away. If our response is, but I, we don't understand salvation. It's supposed to be, but Jesus, you. I uh, work in an office with four other people, and they get a lot of visitors. And so it can get quite chaotic in my office. Um, and I need to focus. I have a really nerdy job where I have to think and focus and stay on task. So what I do is I have headphones on and I listen to music to drown out the outside noise. Sometimes even the music can be a little distracting, but it's less distracting than what's going on in my office. Maybe a month or two ago, I was working and all of a sudden this song came on and it just struck me. I just, I don't usually hear the words, but I heard this song and it stopped me dead in my tracks. And I actually had to look up the lyrics and Steve, if you're watching, I'm pretty sure I did this during a 15 minute break. But uh, I had to look this song up. It's called Sold Out. It's by a band called Hawk Nelson. And uh, as I read these lyrics, I would encourage you not to shout out your amen because, spoiler alert, I actually was really dismayed by what I heard. I ain't like no one you met before. I'm running for the front when they're all running for the door. And I won't sit down. I won't back out. You can't ever shut me up because I'm on a mission and I won't quit now. In a world, world full of followers, I'll be a leader. In a world full of doubters, I'll be a believer. I'm stepping out without a hesitation because the battle's already been won. I'm sold out. I'm no longer living just for myself. Running after Jesus with my whole heart. And now I'm ready to show I am sold out. I'm sold out with every single step that I take now. With every drop of uh, blood left in my veins. I'm going to be making it count. I am sold out. No trials coming against me can put a dent in my passion. They're just an opportunity to put my faith into action. This is a really boastful song. The guy that wrote it is a guy named John Steingard. And about two and a half weeks ago, he put this up on Instagram. This is only a part of it, but this is kind of the crux of what he was saying. May 20th, 2020, he said, after growing up in a Christian home, being a pastor's kid, playing and singing in a Christian band and having the word Christian in front of most of the things in my life, I'm now finding that I no longer believe in God. Here's the second verse of this song. This ain't just some temporary phase. You can't face this kind of grace and leave the way you came. This is permanent with intent. And there won't be no stopping it now. I'm on a mission and it's heaven sent. That is absolutely heartbreaking. When Jesus is judging us someday, is not going to be on the basis of what we did. Unless what we did was throw up our hands and say, God, I cannot save myself. I need you to save me. We call that faith, and that is the sum total of our contribution to our salvation. But if we think that our salvation and our growing closer to God is based on what we do, we need to beware. We need to be very, very careful. Some of the people that will be sent away someday are Christians that have lived in the last hundred years in North America. Even evangelicals, I would suppose. Do we really suppose that the people that Jesus sends away who are prophesying and casting out demons and performing miracles 
somehow forgot to ask Jesus into their heart. In this society, in evangelicalism, they somehow neglected to ask Jesus into their heart. They somehow forgot to make a decision for him. Therefore, you know, it's okay if you disagree with my theology on this. If right now, as I'm describing these people who say, Lord, Lord, and you're like, no, I'm pretty sure that I'm good. It's okay. We can disagree. Because I'm very confident in this last section here. I believe that God is very, very good. And so, whether you agree with me or not, it's okay. Here we go. The wise and the foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You know, there was one other seeming conflict that we saw earlier in there. We can go to that slide as well. I think it's next. Where Jesus had said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But then he also said, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be seen by them. How can it be that Jesus says, let them see your good works, but he also says, do your good works in secret? Here's the deal. The good works that he was talking about that you're supposed to do in secret are stuff that everybody can do. Praying, fasting, giving to the poor. You do not have to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you in order to do these things. You do not have to call yourself a Christian to do these things. You could be a Muslim or a Hindu. I mean, you could be a Satanist and do service projects for your community. The things that are our good works that would cause people to glorify our Father in heaven are things that we do that are supernatural. They're things that human beings cannot do. If you are able to forgive somebody from the heart, that's impossible. If you're able to actually not worry, that's impossible. If you're able to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that's impossible. Right? We must see the Holy Spirit inside of us if any of these things are going to happen, if we are actually going to live these things out. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And Jesus did it. He lived a perfect life. He did it once, and he intends to do it millions of more times in each one of us because it's his spirit inside of us that bears the good fruit. It's his spirit that does these impossible things. So therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, it's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Regardless of whether you agree with my theology on this, it's okay. We have this one last parable here. We have our house. We have our lives, and either they're built on the the rock or they're built on the sand. And maybe sometimes we struggle to tell, boy, I'm really struggling with this sin. I'm really worrying or whatever else. And we're just not sure. By the grace of God, life hits us. And things can get crazy. Things can get really, really tough. And the rains can fall and the floods can rise and the winds can beat against our house. And sometimes, for some people, our house crashes. That can be devastating. It's the worst moment of life without question when that happens. But how good is God that it happens on this side of eternity? If even in 2020, who knows, maybe... 
right now it seems like it's about as bad as it can get. What if it gets worse? And what if some of us find that our houses just cannot stand? Yeah, that's bad news, but the good news is we haven't even begun to live the life that God has for us. We don't even know the goodness of God. There is an opportunity sitting there in front of us. If it turns out in your life and mine at some point that as life gets hard and the rains fall and the floods rise and the winds beat against our house, if we discover that our house collapses, it's okay. It's an invitation from God saying, you need me. So let's watch our lives. We get to watch our fruit. We get to examine our lives against the Sermon on the Mount. We get to see, do I see evidence that God's Holy Spirit is not hiding inside of me? God's Holy Spirit does not hide. But even if I'm not sure, we have this one last opportunity to look at what's going on in my life. As things keep hitting me, am I standing firm or am I collapsing? Instead of really getting focused in on just the tragedy around you, turn your eyes to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. You think he won't take you up on that? He absolutely will. Let's take a few moments to listen to what the Spirit might be saying to us, to reflect. See if he has anything to say.